Okay, and so at this point, I think it's worth just uh, doing a quick check of our understanding of where we're at in the material so far. Uh, and to do that, we're just going to go through kind of a, a toy problem that describes an experimental scenario, a few different situations uh, for RAS signaling. And we'll work through this. Uh, I'll work through it right here in front of you. And as long as we can get through this, uh, we'll have a pretty good sense of how RAS signaling as a system of GAPS, GAPS, and GTPAs works. Um, and so let's just do that right now. So let's say that we have devised an assay that lets us monitor the levels of RAS GTP inside a living cell. So say there's some cell here, and we as an experimentalist have come up with an assay where we can measure the levels of activated RAS in the cell over time. And I'll just mention this assay doesn't actually exist um, in the laboratory right now. So, you know, if you get really excited about RAS, you should be thinking about ways to develop really good assays like this to be able to do the exact type of scenario we're, we're talking about here. And so let's say we've got this assay, and we're going to do a few things with it. Um, we're going to go through a few different scenarios where we're going to stimulate cell and ask how those RAS GTP levels, what do we think is going to happen to them? So let's say that we begin measuring a cell's RAS GTP levels at time zero. And at time 30, we apply some sort of stimulus to the cell that's going to activate a GEF protein. And then at time 90 minutes, we apply a second stimulus. That's going to result in a gap activity in the cell as well, but that's 10 times less than that of the GEF. And so qualitatively, what do we think is going to happen to the RAS GTP levels from t equals 0 to t equals, say, 180 minutes uh, if we're using this assay? And so if you're following along, I just suggest, you know, pause the video for a second, think about what uh, we're asking here, if you can come up with the answer. Okay. So if we read through this, it says that at t equals 30 minutes, we apply a stimulation that activates a GEF protein. Okay? And then at time 90 minutes, we apply a second stimulus that results in a GAP activity that's 10 times less than that of the GEF. And so if we were to just kind of draw out what's happening over time, let's say we're just thinking about the GEF protein now. Uh, the GEF protein is initially low. And then at some time point, 30 minutes, the GEF protein goes high inside the cell, and it's going to stay high for the rest of the experiment. And then if we think about the same thing in terms of the GAP activity, GAP activity is low. And then at, say, 90 minutes, it goes high, but that GAP activity is 10 times less that than that uh, of the GEF. So this is our GAP. And this is our GEF. Okay. And so if we look at this, we can ask what's going to happen to the RAS proteins levels over time. And so initially, there's going to be some level of RAS GTP inside the cell. And when this GEF activity comes along, those levels are going to start to rise in the cell. And then later on, when we apply the GEF, they're going to decrease by some amount. But because the GEF is much higher in its activity than the GAP, we'd expect these uh, levels to level off to some lower level. And so if I had to guess, I would say this is what the uh, shape of the RAS GTP levels are going to look under this scenario. And let's just call this scenario one for now. So let's say we consider now another scenario. And in this case, very similar to the last case, we're going to begin measuring the cell's RAS GTP levels at time zero. And at time 30 minutes, we apply a stimulus, just like before, that's going to activate some GEF protein. And then at 90 minutes, again, we apply a stimulus that results in GAP activity. But this time, it results in 10 times the GAP activity of the GEF protein itself. And so qualitatively, what's going to happen to the RAS GTP levels here from that three-hour window? So again, take a moment, pause the video, work it out for yourself, and then I'll show you how it's done. Okay, and so as before, we can just kind of mark the main things. 30 minutes, we apply a stimulus that's going to activate a GEF protein. At 90 minutes, we apply a stimulus that results in a GAP activity. And that GAP activity is 10 times that of the GEF protein. 
So as before, we can sketch out the GEF and GAP activities. So 30 minutes, some GEF activity is introduced into the cell. And at 90 minutes, some GAP activity is entered into the cell. And this should be 10 times the level of the GAP. So now we think, OK, we're putting in a lot of GAP activity. Okay. So as before, we can now just kind of follow along and say, OK, at the start of the experiment, we've got some GEF activity that's driving activation of RAS. But then we provide this whomping huge amount of GAP activity. And that's going to bring the level way low. It may even bring it all the way down uh, to zero, possibly. And again, we're just mostly interested in the shape, not the exact amounts. Um, but this is a scenario in which that high gap level is going to kind of swamp out the GEF and inactivate. OK, so now let's think of a slightly different scenario. And so let's say the situation is slightly different now. And we're going to begin measuring the cell's RAS GTP levels as before. But this cell constitutively expresses a gap protein at very high levels. And in this case, at time 60 minutes, we stimulate the cell with a growth factor that's going to produce GEF activity. And that GEF activity is going to be 10 times less than that of the gap. And again, qualitatively, what's going to happen in this RAS GTP levels over time curve that you see here? So think about it for a minute and pause the video. And so what's a little bit different about this is that our gap levels are already high throughout the course of the experiment. And so right from the get-go, there's a lot of gap activity inside the cell. And only one hour into the experiment, so something like here, we introduce some gap activity uh, in the cell. This gap activity is, again, much less than that of the gap. So even though some GEF activity is introduced, it's not very much uh, compared to that of the GAP. And so if we were to draw our RAS CTPase levels, they'd be low. And then even though we apply some GEF activity here, this GAP activity is already present. And it's pretty substantial. And so there's not going to be a very substantial increase in the GEF, in the, uh, in the RAS GTP levels that we see inside the cell. And this might seem like kind of a weird scenario, but actually, in many cells, this is sort of the ground state scenario that uh, that we encounter. Cells express a lot of GAP protein, such that little tiny amounts of GEF protein that get activated sort of by spurious, you know, noisy inputs to the cell don't produce a strong RAS GTP response. And so, uh, you know, this is actually a scenario that you can kind of keep in mind a lot of the times for how uh, these signaling systems are working. And so this uh, particular system is going to be interesting in the context of our final example that we'll go through, um, which uh, is very similar to the last one. And in this case, we begin examining a similar cell that expresses, again, a constitutively uh, very high level of gap protein. However, this cell contains a mutation in RAS that prevents it from interacting with GAP proteins. And so at time 60, just like before, we stimulate the cell with a growth factor that results in a GEF activity 10 times less than that of the GAP. So basically identical to what we just did before, but now in this mutant context. And so in this case, qualitatively, what happens to the RAS GTP levels uh, over this window of time like before? And so again, take a moment, think about it, and we'll go through it in just a second. OK, and so our diagram of the GAP and GEF levels is essentially exactly as it was before. We have a very high level of GAP activity inside the cell. And 60 minutes in, some stimulus is applied, results in a small amount of GEF activity relative to this GAP activity. However, the key difference here is that this uh, version of RAS here contains a mutation, and that mutation prevents it from interacting with the GAP protein. Um, and so in this case, when we apply, uh, you know, RAS GTP levels are happening, we apply this GEF, 
um, instead of this gap being able to really effectively uh, inactivate uh, the GTPase, even though this GEF activity is much lower than the gap, the fact that this mutant uh, blocks the gap activity means that your RAS proteins are actually going to get highly activated over time. Okay? And so in this case, uh, even though the levels of GAP and GEF were exactly the same, this mutation uh, results in a completely different signaling outcome uh, from this system than what we saw uh, before. And so I just want to um, summarize the four different scenarios that we saw and explored in this, uh, in this kind of toy system here. Because um, they kind of sum up a few different uh, things that you might see in RAS signaling, and they also highlight uh, a few interesting things. So scenario one, we had a high GEF and a low GAP, and that meant that the RAS GTPase levels would rise, and that GAP would bring them down some, but you'd get a high amount of RAS activity here because the ratio of GEF to GAP was quite high. In scenario two, we had a small amount of GEF stimulus applied, and then at a later point in time, we applied a high amount of GAP activity. So in this case, GEF level, GTPS levels began to rise, but as soon as the gap came on, uh, because the gap was in so much excess of GEF, this kind of swamped out uh, what was happening to the RAS GTP levels. We then described a kind of scenario that's more often like what you see in a cell, where there's a constitutively high level of gap activity inside the cell, and then at some point in time, uh, a GEF's input is applied. And in this case, because the gap levels are massively in excess of the GAF, GEF activity, uh, even though GEF is applied, it results in only a very small or even transient increase in the levels of RAS GTP in the system. However, if we take this exact same scenario and we have a mutant form of RAS that doesn't respond to GAP activity, instead of you getting this kind of filtering out of this small GEF input, that small amount of GEF input is translated into very high levels of RAS GTP because this mutant form of RAS in this uh, scenario doesn't respond to the GAP activity. And, and so from this test of our understanding, there's really two key takeaways that uh, hopefully going through this problem uh, sort of hammered home for you. And the first is that RAS signaling outcomes are defined by the activity of the GEFs and GAPs that regulate that RAS protein. So high amounts of GEF and high amounts of GAP, or low amounts of GEF and low amounts of GAP, or the ratio of those two things, are really going to play an important role in setting what happens uh, when RAS signaling is occurring. And second, a consequence of this is that this makes RAS signaling very sensitive to perturbations or mutations that impact how RAS can be regulated. Uh, and we saw that by that mutant form of RAS that didn't respond uh, to GAP stimulation. And as we will discuss uh, in subsequent lectures, this number two point here, this is one of the main reasons that mutations in RAS signaling are so prominent in cancer and disease. This sensitivity to the configuration of GEFs, GAPs, and the GTPase can very quickly uh, lead to a situation where instead of doing this, you're doing this. And this can result in huge catastrophes to uh, cellular decision-making, development, and other processes, as you'll learn soon.